Out of the street corners they scream. You knew it was coming. You've been waiting for this for months. Rumor hardened into fear and now they scream at you. The sirens, their hysterical wail tearing through the white noise of the city. And you run. You run to pick up those things that can never be replaced. A picture of them in the days when they still loved you. Your mother's wedding ring. And then you turn to your shelf of games. You only have room for five. Five games for Doomsday. Five Games for Doomsday is a show in which board game personalities are thrust into a cabin in the woods to outrun an oncoming disaster, but can only take five of their games with them. But which will they choose? My guest this week is an expert in children's games. In a career stretching over 25 years, he has a list of design credits as long as your arm, which culminated in 2022 with the Kinderspiel des Jahres, the most prestigious award for children's games in the world. My guest this week is Jens Peter Schliemann. Jens Peter, welcome to the cabin. Well, welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is, was it difficult for you to choose the five games to take to the cabin? Um, yes, for sure. I have published more than five games, and uh, but uh, I have some which are my favorites. So, uh, like this, I have chosen uh, five of my games. And and what was the criteria? Was it nostalgia? Was it that you think these are the best ones? Um, yes. Uh, uh, every, every, from everything, it's also the success and for the public people, but also uh, for my creative process where I could fulfill something or realize something where I was glad how it was published with the publisher. So think, uh, in combination, all of this, as a creative, I like... Uh, to be relevant with my creative work, and uh, I guess with these five games, I become, a, I get the feedback that it that it has relevance. <laughs> and and you know you as I you you sent me your your gameography, and there's lots of games there. Do you have a copy of each one in your personal library? Yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and and do you also have the, the foreign language editions? So do you have a whole room dedicated to your own stuff? Yes, uh, uh, not always all uh, from foreign countries uh, because some publishers forgot to send me or things like this, uh, but uh, most of them I also have, yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to the beginning then. So let's go back to the beginning then. So you grew up in Westphalia. Can you tell us... Firstly, something about that part of Germany and and what that was like at the time. Um, It's a part of North Rhine-Westphalia, which is a part of Germany in Western Germany. And I grew up there close to a city. It's called Soest, which has uh, 50,000 inhabitants. So a little city. And yeah, I have, I had a normal, um, childhood there <laughs> with one sister <laughs> yeah and and you you grew up in a divided germany with east and west yes <laughs> did you notice that growing up yes i noticed it and i also uh, noticed the history uh, of nazis and things like this and uh, as a german you are not so proud to be a German like this. It's like this that you feel ashamed also because of this history and things like this. And yeah, you now live in Berlin. You you can you have you must have felt it. Uh, how long does it need that uh, in Berlin the people can come together? And my feeling was like this, that uh, it needs time. But I'm very glad now that we have a united nation now uh, again. Since that- and, and you talk about it. It's very interesting that I speak to Germans. And there is, there is still, even from the Second World War, is very present in Germans' thinking. I mean, what do you think? I mean, you design kids' games, so I, I guess you have contact to, to, to young people. Do you think they still carry that same feeling towards those times as, as someone of your age? 
No, that's uh, it's uh, the war is something which is also in the next generations and as closer as you are in a generation to the people who who were um, um, yeah were in times with the Second World War. Uh, uh, yeah, so like this it is, and I'm glad now that we have such a long peri- period not uh, into war. And um, that helps uh, to be more free, feel more freeness, and to grow up more, um, more open-minded and things like this. So, it, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, for me, it's really something which destroys also culture in Germany. Like maybe uh, the dancing in in between generations or the 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 songs you have in traditionally these things uh, I I like much more in uh, in foreign countries when when in Greece you uh, you dance around in a group or something like this uh, the, like this this happens not so in Germany. Huh? So you you started playing and creating games from an early age. What was the story behind that? Um. Yeah, I, I as a child I liked to play games, and I was always the one in the family who asked, "Can we play a game?" and things like this. And for my birthday or for Christmas, I, one gift was also a, a, a board game, and that was the most important uh, gift I get. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, and and I had a, 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 a in the childhood I had a friend um, in my youth. Which we together create also uh, games like Risk with a with a big map, and uh, which doesn't fit at the table in the uh, children room. So we played at the floor, and um, and the uh, the youth friend was the one who comes with a, a geographic idea or a historical idea. And I was, I has, have a very good mind, mathematical mind. So I could tell them, uh, uh, him, oh, we have to do it like this and it will function and things like this. So, and so like this, we, we create our game and, but that were all not uh, in a commercial manner, only for us. And these games had several rules. And when, uh, when we, uh, Talk to his brother to explain him the, uh, the game. The brothers say after a while, "Oh, uh, let's stop. <laughs> it's not mine." <laughs> so, but we both know our rules, and for us, it was normal to have all these rules inside. Yeah. So, like this, it was. Hmm? And, and so, for over ten years, you lived in the Annaberg dormitory. Yes. What is that, and and how did it help you to become a game designer? Yeah, that uh, was. I I have studied mathematics and two years I uh, was in Brunswick and then I go to Bonn and since then I live here in Bonn and uh, my first uh, uh, living there was in the dormitory Annaber- ha- House Annaberg and it is a student house which is also a castle and with a big forest band so I had the little and the big uh, concerning how to live in ones and on, in this house, there were about 45 students and most on, of them were very creative persons also. So I had a musician beneath me who played six hours a day guitar and, and so on. And this atmosphere there helps me, uh, to find the courage to, to go this, uh, creative way to become a game designer, uh, as a main profession which is more like uh, an artist uh, uh, <laughs> who, uh, yeah, the, the day life uh, is more like an artist so, and also the financial situation is more like an artist. So like this, uh, and um, in my childhood, I had n- not no, no uh, adults which do things like this. So uh, it was very important for me that I found this student house to go uh, to stay there and to fu- uh, t- and that encouraged me to go this uh, way for my life. Mm-hmm. 
So your first game then is Magician's Night. How did you come up with the idea for this game? Yeah, I had several uh, corporations uh, then. Uh, it began uh, uh, no, no, 1996 and 1998. And one of the, my cooperation were with Kirsten Becker, and she was a journalist. And she, uh, our one of our first projects were, uh, uh, yeah, to create a game in the dark with glow in the dark elements. And she had the idea. In the first cha- time, she told me I was a bit oh, like this. Oh, what what can it be? And after thinking one night over this. Uh, I thought, okay, it's a good challenge to do so. And then uh, this uh, become our task. Uh, so we, our task was uh, to create a game with, which you can play really complete. You sit at the table uh, and you you make it complete dark in your room. And uh, the elements uh, you use are glow in the dark elements. So like this, we want to create a game. And uh, this task was uh, bigger than our creativity was in, at this moment. So if you I- imagine uh, to roll a, a, a to roll a die uh, is uh, something which is not nice in the dark, or to hold cards in in the dark is also not nice. So usual things you know from board games that doesn't function uh, with uh, with the idea we had to uh, to realize a board game and so we need to be inspired by other things like uh, 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 we saw someone who make a jonglage in the dark and we liked the moving light points uh, uh, several moving light points or things like this. And so uh, we had to find inspiration from very outside. Uh, so looking out of the box <laughs> concerning our development. So, and that's uh, why this was also a very, uh, very intense and very good uh, um, creative process for me, which, which helps me uh, uh, f- uh, uh, also for the uh, further uh, creative processes, and and so I've I've met a lot of designers. I've played a lot of prototypes. But if you're if you're designing a sort of standard board game, you have cards, you have pieces, you have dice, you have a board, and you to to make a prototype is not so difficult. But with this, you have very specific components and very specific conditions. How do you make a prototype for a game like this? Yeah, I have to find out. I, I'm, uh, I like to use materials in board games. So um, I have also the passion, like an artist, to make something out of materials that there's a functional uh, functionality inside and things like this. And um, if you try to be innovative like this, that you don't use a usual concept, uh, which where you have samples of board games which are realized like this, then you are more at the beginning like a scientist that you yet that you build up a sample that you try out and yet that you explore a bit. Uh, the world you have and you try to find out and you you look in in every area and and you look as long as possible uh, as you find comfortable with the situation you have and only in this moment when you feel a bit comfortable feel a bit like this that you know now the area you which is innovative and which you uh, try to find out then you can begin with structures to define something in this area uh, to make uh, game rules out of it. So I want to move on now and talk about you as a designer. So, you know, you designed games as a kid, and but they were just, they were just for you and your friend. When did you realise that you were good at designing games? 
as a child, I was, uh, I like to win games. So, uh, and that's, uh, that uh, awakes in me uh, the structural thinking, I think. And that forms for me, uh, I was a normal pupil in school, but uh, uh, in mathematics, I was very talented. So, because when the teacher uh, told something, I thought, okay, I know it from the games. It was very, very uh, immediately clear for me. And so at the beginning uh, in my childhood, and I also at the beginning as a game designer, um, uh, mathematics uh, were, uh, and uh, designing games were, or playing games were a deep hole, like a deep hole. So it influenced together. And so I... I had also a cooperation with Michael Antonov and with him, I had played a lot these two person strategic games. And that allows me to, to find out easily something about dynamics. So, uh, we met from the uh, afternoon until the evening and, uh, we had, uh, we had a rule, we played and we changed a bit the rule and we played and so on. So I could see by changing a bit how they did, uh, it influenced the dynamics. And, we're, and also with uh, the risk-like games, with I, which I played with, uh, 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 with uh, um, a childhood friend, uh, I think both genres are very good for, were very good for me to know about much about uh, dynamics in games and the dynamic is the main thing in the development of a game so uh, a game is always an in-between situation of something uh, which you can describe and so uh, and the, the dynamic and the dramaturgy is the main aspect you have to solve when you create a game and so like this uh, I had made many experience on these areas, but I'm not so active anymore in these areas. I I like much uh, the children games because the children games, in my point of view, are the most creative concerning innovative concepts because you can use the base of materials very often. And in this manner, I guess there can be so many games which are still not in invented by now. And and what was the first game that you had published? Um, uh, that was a card game uh, called Daum drauf, uh, thump on it, uh, and yeah, it was uh, in the context of the um, um, Spiele Autoren Stipendium that is given in the at Göttingen at the Göttingen. Uh, game designer meeting for one uh, beginning game designer and I won this uh, at 1995 and um, uh, that means that you have four times the possibility to make a practica in an institution for uh, for the board games and I, wa I go to the company Drei Magier and uh, they told me that they like to make a game uh, like uh, Alex Randolph's Ghosts with Good and Bad Ghosts, but not uh, with this theme with snakes, with, with good and bad snakes. And then I said to uh, Johan Rüttinger, okay, I can think about it. And overnight I've uh, made a concept. And then the next day I said, I had an idea for a card game and I uh, can I build it? Yeah, and she, he said yes. And it's the evening we played it. And it was one of my fastest developments. So <laughs> he liked it very much. And so he published it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and how did it feel to have that first game published, to see, to see your name on a box? Yeah, that's... Um, that's really great um, because uh, as a creative uh, in board games, it's 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 like this that uh, there are still also professional illustrators and professional uh, realizations from the companies by producing the game, but uh, the main thing, the composing unit, 
comes from the uh, is coming from the game designer itself so you can really see that it is something you have created also when it is published and when it is um, uh, added by some professional work and so this is something which is really fulfilling when you have something which is in in a box uh, and you can say that's the main part of this is from from yourself or i often do it with cooperation partners so together with my cooperation partners but then we we do this process of developing together and all together so everyone is responsible for the composing un unit and so it's for both of us mostly i do it with uh, two person corporations uh It's for both of us as a feeling that it's our uh, our game, yeah. And so you've talked about how you like to work with materials. What what makes you good at designing children's games? Um, yeah, uh, uh, one main thing in uh, in children games is um, oh, what makes me good. M My grandpa, <laughs> I played a lot uh, uh, Kniffel. Uh, I always remember playing with my grandpa uh, when I when I develop uh, uh, children games. So, uh, so this feeling, I uh, I like the, also the aspect of family games in children games that uh, that the parents or grandparents play with the children also, and um, yeah. Yeah. What, uh, so the other thing, what makes children games good is, uh, if you, if I can see children doing something very self motivated, that's often a basic idea for a children game. So for my Magic Mountain now, uh, the beginning idea was uh, that uh, that. Uh, How, when you look at preschool children, how they can look like a ball rolls a ball track uh, down. Uh, that's something how fascinated they could be. So, so if they if they uh, if they like to stay uh, uh, on a, on a, on something. Uh, Uh, in in their um, aufmerksamkeit in their uh, uh, attention yeah um, then then you realize that they like to occupy with something maybe longer and things like this and that could be a good basis to create a game and so magic mountain is a basis to realize a board game which has as a basis a ball track and uh, is something for also preschool children. And that's also, I like also uh, then to have a good beginning idea, but then add uh, several ideas which are really fit together so that it becomes a composing unit. And uh, that's, that's a need for a board game that you have, Uh, finally a composing unit where all the ideas you bring together really fits together so uh, have have are not only put together as ideas that uh, that ideas become also itself when you two, put two ideas together that they they itself become an, a unit and so like this is the way of uh getting in a process, uh, getting, yeah, and try to develop, yeah. So your next game then is Chateau Rock 4. Mm -hmm. Why have you chosen this one? Um, yeah, this was a very nice process um, because uh, under the composing aspect, uh, there are different levels in the game. Uh, the Base level uh, the, the, is the cellar uh, of the uh, of the castle, and uh, in the game, mice mice run around at the castle and looking for cheese. But they can also uh, um, 
trap into the cellar. So, um, and uh, then there is a movable uh, floor and there are roofs which, which you can uh, open to look where the cheese is. So you have uh, different uh, levels uh, of of uh, things uh, of uh, materials you, we we combine combine together to become a composing unit and also the work together with the company was very good so uh, i guess this is one of my uh, first project where the composing come together is is was very good and also complex and and you did this one with bernard weber yes who you eventually won the the kinderspiel des Jahres with why is he good to work with um yes in a creative uh process you need euphoria and you need also criticism Uh, euphoria you need to 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 go forward with your process because uh, if you uh, many projects can stop at a level but that shouldn't shouldn't be the level that you can uh, go to companies and they will say okay fine we want to publish it so you 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 have always projects which reach a little a level, but maybe not the level uh, uh, good enough to go to the company uh, to, to the publishers, and um, so you always need a new euphoria if you want to go forward with the process. And on the other hand, euphoria maybe let you not not look to the left and right concerning uh, the going forward. So sometimes uh, you need also the critic uh, uh, as another phase of, uh, of your crea uh, creative process that you realize, oh, on this point, it's not uh, good fulfilling something. It's, uh, it has problem, still problems and things like this. And I guess... I'm the more euphoric in our teamwork and uh, Bernard is a very good critic <laughs> and in critics. So I guess we can combine uh, these both talents on this way very good so uh, that we both together uh, can fulfill something which can reach a, a high level. <laughs> And and what happens if you disagree? <laughs> um, it's not like this that we disagree uh, so hardly that we didn't find a consensus. Uh, it's sometimes it's. It, uh, I worked together with Bernard since 1998 in Team Annaberg and 1990, uh, 2003 we begin a uh, two person co cooperation and um, we, yeah and um, in, with the years the critic becomes harder and harder <laughs> but uh, we know much more also each other so We know also uh, when you when you work together more than 20 years uh, that uh, that we can solve uh, also the 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 distance we have if there's a distance. But in but generally we often also have a also a common sense. So um, I guess in. I have several different cooperation partners uh, which, uh, with whom I design games. And uh, I couldn't work with someone together where I have to ask always, is it now the right way to go forward or not? It, it, it's so often that we are in, in an un, uh, unspoken consensus that we go now forward in this manner. And because every second, sometimes every second, you make a decision in the creative process, and you can't always say, uh, ask the other, is it now right or not? So you have 
uh, you need to have a common feeling concerning this. So I want to talk now more broadly about children's games. And I obviously, I, I, well, not obviously, but I, I don't have children. And so I don't play children's games very often. So you're the expert here. So you need to educate me. So what, so firstly, what is the key to designing a good children's game? Yeah, compared to adult games, um, I guess uh, you have to be always very near to the intuition of, of the children, how they like to play a game. So if you realize in first tests with children that your, your rules are not like the, the children want to play, you have no chance to realize such a game. You have to adapt the rules to the intuition of the children. And it's so important that they into initially uh, always uh, close uh, during the whole uh, playing process uh, to that what in the game happens. So that's also, uh, in my opinion, the greatest challenge uh, that you didn't lose the children concerning this during the game party. And a vital part of designing games is playtesting. Who is your playtest group? Yeah, that's for me easy because uh, you can go to schools uh, in the after, uh, afternoon. The, the, the children are also at school and they have often also free time. So I can go there to playtest and also in the kindergarten. It's also possible. So I also also have no children, but uh, I can I uh, I go there and I play test if I uh, if I have uh, my prototypes to play test. I play test in, in in complete children groups in family situations and also in pure adult groups and also to see the target group and uh, my games are often so material orientated that that they only fit in the big boxes for the children and that me that also means that they are mostly 30 euro games um, for the customers and so uh, also the companies say uh, and also my uh, interest is it also that it's still also interesting for the adults, not for the uh, the players who love to play uh, complexly, but for the normal adults who have children and like to play also with their children and not want to be bored by a too easy children game, which is not interesting uh, for them anymore. So I, I like to have such a, a situation like this also. And so you've been in the industry since the 90s. So you've seen, I presume, a lot of changes in the in the children's games market. How has that market changed over the years? Yeah, it's also a very growing market, like for the adult games, similar. And um, yeah, uh, it it's possible more possible to have more uh, materials in so that's also a main aspect for me that uh, some games nowadays are possible for me to realize which were 15 years ago not possible to realize so it becomes more three dimensional the build up it's very common uh, to build up something in the box um so you have the 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 um, lower part of the box and build up inside so that you have a three three dimensional build up or something like this, and also like for the adult games there was is also a trend for cooperative games. I guess that uh, we we live in times uh, that. Our main uh, challenges are the climate change or the pandemic, something like this. So abstract, more abstract uh, counterparts 
uh, where uh, where we have to interact as people concerning these challenges. And like this are often the cooperative games. You have a game system where you play against something in the game system and you interact as a playing group. And I guess this will, this will be also in the next years a big trend uh, that we will have more and more also cooperative games and children games. And so sometimes there is a game that sort of breaks through, a children's game that breaks through into the adult market and adults play it without children around. And Rhino Hero is is one of the games that I can think that that happened. I mean, when you see groups of adults playing children's games together and, and enjoying them, does that surprise you? Um. Mm. I guess uh, playing is something which begins with our childhood. So in our childhood, uh, that's that's playing is usual day life, and um, the adult uh, board games is only an expression of this that we that we still not still miss this playing. Uh, uh, from our childhood, I guess. And um, I guess in a cultural manner, it's a nice thing to cultivate this also for the adults. And also, if you allow yourself, uh, like, like uh, sitting in a sandbox <laughs> uh, as an adult and to, pl- to form something with sand, it ca- can be that you feel like a little child uh, again and that can be i guess that can be very relaxing and it's not something which you have to laugh about i think it's a chance for us as adult to to have a relaxing time and um like this i guess it is with with playing <laughs> that's that's the cause why we still like to play and on the other hand playing is something which is very related to a general creativity and creativity is something which our mankind can bring forward bring to to a future aspects in our world and so like this uh, creativity and playing is still related also concerning our nowadays jobs or things like this. So uh, it, it, it's cultural relevant, I guess, to, to allow us uh, to be playful together. Uh, so your next game then is Talo. And, and this is a family game as opposed to a children's game. How is the design process different when designing something that's structured for the whole family? Yeah, the beginning is funny because I do this project with two primary school teachers. And our aim was to realize a game uh, for the first calculating with the numbers from 1 to 10. And in the game now, there we have blocks with the length from 1 to 10. And you make a build up out of these wooden blocks. And you can climb with your figure as, as steps uh, 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 to the next level from 1 to 10. And the first one who will be reach level 10 will win the game. And... Um, and uh, you roll the die, and if you roll, uh, for example, the seven, you can choose a block seven, but you can also choose two blocks, maybe two or five and five, or three or four. And with this dividing of the seven, you are always calculating in a good manner for the first for the first learning of calculating. And that was a, is a beginning idea to create a learning game. But it was so funny for families that it becomes a normal family game with the, with the additional aspect that, pre- uh, uh, um, that primary school children 
uh, learn the first calculating, but they didn't realize that it is a, a learning game because it's still a fun family game. And if you were to recommend this game to us, the people listening to this as players, how would you recommend it to us? Um, yeah, to you. Uh, I can say it's for me, it's something fulfillable because as uh, I said before, when I was a child I in school, I heard something about mathematics and I thought that comes from the games. Uh, and so for me, mathematics and games are so related together that I guess everything in school you can learn by playing games <laughs> uh, concerning the mathematics. And so one of my passion is to do something for this that... Uh, that it's uh, more fun to learn mathematics and so like this. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's also a material oriented game so that you make a build up and this build up is always different, uh, concerning the different, uh, the blocks you have. So it's still uh, also concerning the material aspect and an aesthetic game. And so what percentage of the games you've designed are, are children's games and what percentage are family games? And and why do you focus more on one than the other? Um, as I said, uh, in Germany, they are typically uh, presented as children games um, because, uh, yeah, because... Uh, of the power of the uh, Game of the Year award. And uh, we have the category Kinderspiel des Jahres and Spiel des Jahres and Kennerspiel des Jahres. And uh, uh, my games fits more in this category Kinderspiel des Jahres. But as if you see Geister, Geister, Schatzsuchmeister from Mattel, they position this game as a family game in the other countries. But here in Germany, it's defined as a children game. So for me, it's also, I would love if my uh, children games would be more published like family games, because I guess for normal people, which are not so confirmed playing always board games, um, my children games are normal family games, like in the 80s in, or 90s in Germany, it was usual. <laughs> so I want to talk now about some other aspects of your career. So firstly, can you tell us what the Game Inventors Studio is? Yes, that was an idea of mine. Uh, 2006, I become successful with Magician's Night and Chateau Rock 4, and I saw in uh, Cologne a little magazine uh, with a show window, which was to rent, and I began to rent it. And uh, that was from 2006 to 2013. So I had a working place in the center of Cologne, 500 meters from the main station, and with a show window. And... Uh, Beneath the show window, there was the entrance door. And behind the show window, I had my table where I can eat, work, and play. And sometimes it happens because in my show window, I had my published games uh, that I get in uh, visual contact with uh, visitors at my show window. And um, sometimes I go outside and talk with them. And sometimes they come inside and play with me. So I... I <laughs> I do this uh, game inventor study because as a child I was very shy and um, it I like to show myself in this period of time uh, with my with my passion to uh, and designing games and that helped me to compensate this a bit <laughs> in this period of time this shyness I had in the childhood. And and so you were also the chairman of the Game Designers Studio from 2005 to 2007. What what is that and what was your role there? Um yeah this uh, this is called uh, 
Game Designer Association or Spieleautorenzunft in German. And that's an association which was built in the beginning of the 90s from game designers uh, like Klaus Teuber, Wolfgang Kramer and so on. And it's a game designer session, association with about, I guess now, 500 members. Uh, 400 members are German-speaking members and also 100 uh, non-German-speaking members. And it's the game designer association which represents the interest of the game designers compared to the companies and so so they give help for beginning game designers co concerning contracts and so and you get free if you're a member you get free entrance at the Nuremberg Fair and uh, because the Nuremberg Fair is only for professional workers for the um, uh, toy and game industry and so you so like this you um, so it's an Yeah, and, and this is a group uh, very interesting for uh, um, upcoming game designers to become member. So it helps you uh, to go uh, to become more professional in with your work. And so also you offer a one-week game design internship. What is that and why do you offer it? Yeah, uh, this... Uh, It's called Spieleautorenstipendium. That means a uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, game designer grant. Yeah, game designer grant. Right. Yes, and uh, this is given at the Göttingen Game Designer Meeting, which is in mostly in the beginning of June every year, and. Uh, that's a game designer meeting where you can go uh, about uh, 200 game designer go there every year. And uh, if you are a, a game designer who has not published yet and has still two games uh, designed, you can, you can be, you can, you can go for this, uh, Game designer grant, uh, and, and uh, then five people are nominated for this, and one will get this. And um, the one who gets this gets 3,000 euro and finance with this four practical places for one, one, one week each. So you can go one week to the Ravensburger publisher, uh, Uh, one week off mm, to Handsome Glück, uh, one week to uh, a shop in Göttingen, uh, a magazine for board games, and also mm, to me as a game designer. So, so to make your, to get in contact to, with, the, uh, with the branch uh, and, uh, Yeah, and learn something. How does it function um, uh, when you want to become a game designer? And uh, I, with the beginning of my game designers uh, or game inventor studio 2006, I offer this uh, one week practical week uh, at my home uh, now. And, and what if if I were to win the stipendium and come and do your do your internship week? What would I be doing? Um, yes, then we can discuss your projects. I can tell you about my projects, uh, so you realize my day life a bit. How I'm how how I have uh, uh, built up my game designer activities uh, and how I organize myself and things like this. So so that you as a beginning a game designer can realize what does it mean to become a game designer. You can hear, can ask me things. You can hear uh, from my side uh, concerning processes I had with uh, different publishers experiences I have uh, what what's uh, yeah what's uh, difficult uh, to uh, to to be a game designer what's uh, 
what's challenging and things like this. So, so you may realize a bit more when you are a, a beginning game designer. Do you like to go more deeper into this process or you can more realize what's, uh, what's the reality to do so? So your next game then is Magic Mountain. And I guess that Thomas Mann was not an inspiration. <laughs> no, uh, not really. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, der Zauberberg is, is a title which is, uh, were re related for the public people to this, uh, uh, to this story. Uh, but, uh, because we use this, uh, uh, with, with ball track as a idea. So the board is a little bit, uh, uh like a, a roller track, um, where the balls can roll down and, so, and we have, we had this magic scene that there, uh, that there are little magicians, uh, which we, uh, which we all move together, uh, and which can, which reach the area of Baldwin, uh, uh, down at the mountain before the, uh, uh b before the witches comes down. So, because we use this magic theme, we call it Zauberberg Magic Mountain. Mm -hmm. And so this this game won the Kinderspiel des Jahres this year. Yes. Why do you think that was? Um, I guess uh, two reasons. One reason is with the first ball you play, you are in the game. Uh, it's immediately understandable, but... Uh, it's also like this that you, that the, especially the children like to occupy, uh, several parties with it because, um, the ball rolls, not, uh, one, one pass, uh, one sp a special pass. There are, the, the ball can make very often 50 50 decision to go to the left or to the right in uh, at the board and um as i said we, you want to bring uh, the little magicians uh, along the path and not the uh, not the witches so if the ball reach uh, the little magician you are allowed to bring this little ma magician along the path down forward but if the ball rolls to the uh, uh, to the witch uh, the, the witch goes down and uh, so you are always when the ball rolls uh, you are always hoping oh not to the left now to the right and so on uh, so you are this is always challenging to look at what happens where the ball rolls and so uh, the chance element we have here is very attractive it's more attractive I guess like rolling the die and oh no n number three I had to roll number four to to reach this figure. Then you have a transformation from the looking at the number to the field where you make your move. But in our uh, ball track, you see directly where the ball rolls. It happens what uh, where the figure can move, and so like this. It's much more direct with the feelings to hope and uh, will it reach the little magician or will it reach the, the witches? And so was it a surprise that you won this year or did you have a feeling? Um, yes, uh, uh, there were also members of the jury which criticize the game and so I thought oh hope not so, too much I Bernard and me we both realized that we had a good game and that also uh, the realization of Amigo uh, the publisher was so good that every uh, thing is functional that's also still a challenging factor when you uh, publish a game with which is material orientated. The production must be like this that it's really fun good functional. And so we know we had we have something good and so we hoped. 
and yeah, and the most awful period of time is between the nomination and uh, uh, and the time when they give the award Kinderspiel des Jahres. Uh, there was one month between, and then you know you are under. Uh, there are three games and one is yours. Uh, yeah, and I I had uh, uh, had it the third time with um, Magicians Nine to, N Night 2006, with Vampires of the Night 2010, and now 2022 with uh, Magic Mountain. And yeah, that's really hard because then in this period of time you have days where you are always in this uncertain mood and can't do anything the whole day <laughs> and yeah and but after winning this award it's it's a feeling i can't say clearly uh, when i was a child i i wrote i think a little article about alex randolph when i was 12 or 13 and i thought oh that's something i want to do and when you then uh, as a, in in student age, decide to become a game designer. You know about uh, Spiel des Jahres, and that's that's something you you wish to win someday. And when and now I'm fifty four, <laughs> and now I won this <laughs> uh, the first time, and that's something very fulfilling and uh it's not so uh, di direct uh uh fun or something uh, it's more something a feeling that uh, that it is uh, yeah that something fulfilling comes inside you and i really need time to realize to yeah to feel what does it make with me and things like this yeah but it's great <laughs> and so you hear a lot of people in the industry talk about the spiel des jahres and they say that the effect on a game is massive it means you will sell a minimum of x amount of copies i mean what effect do you think winning the the kinderspiel will have on your career um I guess with my uh, mathematical mind, I was, I, I like uh, also to do things in a challenging manner or a player do, do this also. But when you are creative, uh, it's not always nice to, to be motivated in a challenging manner. It's also nice to be motivated, more, more relaxed. <laughs> and I guess, uh, this fulfilling now is something which let me more relax and designing games is so much experience based also, uh, that you, and creativity has also so much to do with, yeah, with going forward, uh, like an euphoric, but also being relaxed to be critic or being relaxed to, to get the feeling for a right creative solution you quarrel with. And so like this, I guess, I will have a new basis in my mind setting maybe, which will help me maybe to make new experience concerning my creativity. <laughs> yeah. So like this, I don't, I don't think so that it will make, help me so much, uh, concerning the companies. Maybe they now look a bit more, but they all, they knew me, the, all the, companies who do a children game knew me and like to look at my games and knew often that it's challenging to realize my games because I'm so material oriented. Yeah. 
it can help maybe um, in two manners, uh, Magic Mountain, because uh, I had published uh, also with Bernard 2010, also uh, a marble track ga based game at Ravensburger and Magic Mountain is still the second chance uh, concerning the same basic idea. And it was risky uh, to do so because um, with, uh, with offering the second chance to publishers, um, we thought maybe we get the feedback uh, mostly from the companies, oh, Ravensburger has done it and they didn't sell it well, so it's not nothing for us. Uh, but we realized with the Ravensburger publication, um, it was not the be uh, realized the beginning idea that the preschool school children could, could play good enough with it. And we felt we have to redo this uh, again. And I'm very glad that the second chance now is uh, such successful like yet now, because now I can argue against the companies. Sometimes a good idea needs a second chance. <laughs> because uh, that's like this. If you are a scientist concerning a beginning idea that you didn't, didn't have any sample, how like, a, yeah, like a domino like game, uh, you can, you, you know, the complexity, you do, you know, uh, uh, how to lay the tiles, uh, the rhythm of the game, uh, the play rhythm and things like this. So you have so many, uh, things you can adapt your creation, but if you have a beginning idea where there's no sample like this, you have to find out, as I said before. And sometimes this find out maybe needs this second chance <laughs> because you, in the first, uh, uh, in the first time you, you didn't find out good enough or you, and it's so, Often for an innovative game, it's so such a long period of time uh, to come to this point that you are so that you have a have, have really a game which uh, which fits into the market. So I want to talk now about the future. So so what games do you have coming out in the future? <laughs> um. Um, yeah, um, I like still uh, using materials uh, and the use of materials, I guess, is something that can happen so many different games still, which are still not invented. So like this, I'm still working. I'm... I'm very... I'm working also uh, closely together with... Uh, manufacture uh, longshore in Hong Kong. So I have the chance also with the help of them to realize prototypes. And I'm, I'm more and more uh, near to toys because with sometimes uh, when you look at the toys, it's always the same because they, they have not so often Designers from outside, uh, they have house, house intern designers. And that means that they can't be so innovative, <laughs> I guess. And, uh, so like with the roller track or with these glow in the dark, uh, materials, which are things which you know from the toys. I like to add to such a toy aspect, uh, the process of playing. Uh, of design playing like in a board game so that you uh, so that you don't let the children too much alone so that you design for the children also a very challenging or very yeah very challenging process for them and but I I also like when uh, it's very easy concerning the uh, to learn rules so uh 
one aspect to use materials, uh, new materials for a, a game development is that the functionality of the game uh, materials are the beginning rules of a game, which you never have to explain because it's uh, it's uh, functionality you realize by doing uh, with it. And uh, so like this, you have the chance to become very, very easy concerning the learning rules. And that, um, that's still challenging for me to do so. And so why do you think the children's games are important? Um, uh, I think games are important because games are able to communicate to us in another manner than words or something like this. Words are more defining something which is stable like this. And in a game, you can realize a dynamic, something which is in between uh, something you can define. And uh, in this manner, I guess, there begins often understanding of something, like uh, understanding uh, maybe also mathematics as a, as a sample. If you only uh, define uh, mathematics, it's not interesting to understand. It's interesting when you play with it in your mind, when you see the in-between of this and this, then, uh, and so like this is our mind. Our mind likes to occupy with something which is maybe to, uh, to be realized only in a process and not only by defining something. And so like this, uh, the, the, the object of communicate something, uh, the games is something which is cultural important. And yeah, so like this, it's for all of us important and especially for our children because our children are our future. So your last game then is Piazza Rabazza. So tell us about this game. Yeah, that will be published at Soch uh, in autumn. So you will see it at the Essen Fair. And it's a game I have designed together with Guido Hoffmann. And uh, the build-up is a city with doors. And you can uh, go into the city with a pizza driver. And the pizza driver can bring a pizza to the inhabitants. And... In the walls, there are magnets at the position where the inhabitants are. And the pizza is a metal plate. So if you uh, bring with the pizza driver uh, the pizza close to a inhabitant in the city, then the pizza claps at the wall with the inhabitant, uh, uh, which is illustrated at the wall. But... Uh, you get an order at the beginning, so you have to bring the pizza to the right inhabitant. But if you drive too close uh, to another inhabitant, then this inhabitant can grab the pizza. <laughs> so like this is a game. <laughs> and, and so what do you think makes this one unique? Yeah, it's uh, uh, I get very good feedback from the children because... You have many uh, funny-looking inhabitants in the city. Uh, the children love pizza. They love to drive with a Vespa. Uh, they would like to uh, to do this as a little children that they can drive uh, a, pit, uh, uh, a Vespa, and they love to clap the pizza to the inhabitant and things like this. So it's it's very close. Uh, to a theme which children love to do and uh, laugh about. And then we have an extra fun element because there's Pino, that's a 
the baker of the pizzas and he is in the middle of the city and uh, there's a wind up in the city so, so you can uh, you wind up the wind up and then uh, the whole city is wobbling <laughs> so that's uh, really a crazy piazza rabazza i got one more question then so uh you're driving out of bonn towards the cabin and the car goes round a corner and the back door of the car flies open four of the games fall into a river and are swept away forever which game do you hope is sitting on the back seat of the car um yeah i guess it's still magician's night because it showed me the creative way <laughs> Excellent. So if people want to see what you're up to and know when you've got games coming out, how can they do that? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, mostly my new games are at the Essen Fair or the Nuremberg Fair. And your yeah, board game geek, I guess uh, you can inform about me uh, what's new. Yeah, so like this, yeah. I'm uh, so, so in autumn will come this game and uh, for for next game I didn't know yet I have no further contract yet. Hmm. Excellent. Well, Jens Peter Schliemann, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Ben. <laughs> You can support the show in many ways. You can tell your friends. You can talk about it on social media. You can talk about it in your own blog, podcast or video. Or you can support it directly by going to patreon.com forward slash 5 g for d for a rolling donation or for a one-off donation hitting the PayPal link at the bottom of the website 5 gamesfordoomsdaycom It's these donations that keep the show going. Also, if you want to say something nice about the show, or if you want to say something horrible about the show, you can contact me on Twitter at 5games4doomsday, or send me an email at 5gamesfordoomsday at gmail.com. And if I've managed to hop on an e-scooter to flee the ever-increasing temperatures, and Henri, Henri's brother, I'll see you in two weeks for another 5 Games for Doomsday. <laughs>